Exactly why does the Jeep Wrangler 4xe plug-in hybrid keep doing this? It launches that removable roof up into the air. That has to be the most efficient way to get a hard top off a Wrangler. Just saying. Now, here's another Wrangler 4xe having essentially the same tantrum, only this time deep inside its lair in Colorado. Garage explosion involving a Jeep hybrid electric vehicle in Colorado. Amazingly, thankfully, no firefighters were hurt on either occasion. The Renault Zoe EV also has a rather similar random crematorium surprise and delight feature that's built in, but amazingly not in the brochure. It's gonna pop, and there it goes. And that's with the rear hatch open, so it's functioning as something of a pressure relief valve. And yet the force of the explosion was still great enough to tear all four door locks apart. Combustion cars just don't do this in practice. Another crematorium Zoe EV blew a small parking garage into the next life in Germany recently. So exactly what makes these two very different EVs so freaking special? And why is nobody except this guy and now me, why is nobody talking about it. I'm Johnny Logan from AutoExpert.com.au, new cars cheap, Australia only, website, card. So the basic problem here is that both the Renault Zoe EV and the Wrangler 4xe plug-in hybrid have a passenger compartment predisposed, seemingly purpose-built, to fill up with toxic explosive gas should the battery enter a state of thermal runaway. Obviously, this is a very dangerous situation because if there's a source of ignition, like heat or a spark, you get a violent, destructive deflagration event, i.e. a subsonic explosion. In other words, you've got hazmat and shrapnel, bits of building, bits of car being ejected many metres at speed with firefighters and bystanders in the general public potentially just right there in the line of fire in terms of both mechanical damage and or toxic injury. Why did these two vehicles in particular appear to be emerging as front runners in the 2024 hazmat hilarity sweepstakes in electric utopia. Why is it? What is it about the Wrangler and the Zoe that makes them so damn special? This video is supported by Olight. Black Friday sale is on right now until midnight on the 29th of November. I'm gonna put a full list of noteworthy Olight mentions in the description, but today I wanna to highlight just three absolute standouts. The Marauder Mini is the closest thing to a lightsaber there is, especially this limited edition golden black stonewashed kind of finish. It's brand new, obviously, but it looks as if Obi-Wan might have handed it down just before that fateful incident with Luke's father. If you do the outdoors thing regularly, this light is a 600 meter searchlight, and then you just flick the toggle switch and it becomes a 7,000 lumen floodlight, turning night into day at any campsite. Seven different brightness levels and a neat safety function on the switch that prevents accidental activation in your vehicle or a bag. Standard charging arrangement is magnetic, the MCC3 thing, which is very clever. This torch is awesome overall. I've got one permanently at the main door to the fat cave, just in case something happens in the middle of the night. Then there's the O-Tackle A1, the new multi-function hatchet. This thing is properly awesome, and it is scary sharp out of the box. There are two facets on the hatchet, plus there's a hammer with a milled face on the reverse side, and a nail puller and pry bar down the far end of the handle. It's made of 50 CR15 MOV stainless steel, 
meaning it's a chromium molybdenum vanadium alloy, which is commonly used in high-end German kitchen knives. It's great for durability and edge retention. The big hole in the head is awesome for choking up on for fine work, like if you want to use your hatchet like a knife or a scraper, and you can hang it from that in the workshop. It comes with a Kydex sheath and a belt clip. It's hardened to about 56 Rockwell C, and it's the full tang in between the G10 scales. It's 4.8 millimeters thick too, so good luck breaking it, even with high manual effort. This thing is a really useful general purpose tool in the bush, and if you're ever in the unfortunate position where you need to breach a window or a door of a car or a building, either to get yourself out in a fire or some other emergency, or to get yourself in and then help somebody else get out, Having this is pretty much a superpower. Olight tells me there's plenty of stock this month too. Supply of the Otakel A1 was a little bit limited last month because it was newly released and it was all a bit of a rush, but they tell me there's plenty now. So sorry if you missed out, but go again this month and you won't be disappointed, I'm told. And finally, just a little something for dessert. And by dessert, I mean that full zombie apocalypse you've been secretly hoping for. And that would be the new Warrior X4 Tactical Torch. This thing is awesome. And it's got a couple of big improvements too. It takes the regular magnetic charger, like the MCC3 charger, but you can also use any old standard USB-C cable, such as the one that charges your laptop. The new tail switch is two-stage, and you can easily feel the stages, even if you're wearing gloves, and this new switch makes it dead easy to clear away any ferromagnetic debris, like it just wipes off. There's a new injection molded case as well, which is super convenient, and now you don't have to undress to get it on or off your belt, so that's great. It offers fantastic retention of the torch, and it's easy to deploy, which is kind of important because the torch itself is a bit big for the pocket. 2600 lumens on maximum brightness, so it's pretty bright, and it's IPX8 rated as well, so you're not going to drown it. It's still IPX8, even with the USB port open. I do find the new Warrior X4 oddly stimulating in ways in which perhaps a normal person would not. And yet, I'm reluctant to seek any treatment whatsoever about this. Links in the description, and let us not forget, Christmas is rushing at you like an out-of-control freight train. Just saying. Thanks very much, Olight. I appreciate the support. Check out those links. The discounts are huge for the next few days. Back to the Wrangler and the Zoe now, and the pesky exploding problem. This guy is Captain Patrick Durham. He's the captain and training officer at Station 4 on the Troy Fire Department in Michigan, America. Detroit love, dude. Like, it is a thing. He's also a mechanical engineer, and essentially that means that he has bled from the freaking ears multiple times, learning such things as solid mechanics, applied kinematics, thermodynamics, multivariable calculus, ordinary differential equations, Laplace, Fourier... Dude, we could be here all day. It really is an endurance event, such a qualification. Troy is north of Detroit, if memory serves. The infamous Motor City, at least it was, about 15 miles out to the north, I think. You can almost smell Canada from there in the morning. That smell of politeness wafting in over the lake. Troy is just next to a place called Big Beaver. I'd be quite interested to know the history there, just saying. Troy is not that far from Belmont or Van Steuben or Poltown East, if perhaps you're visiting and you'd like to get shot by a gangbanger on an otherwise pleasant afternoon, visiting the Motor City, seeing the sights, getting shot, etc. To Captain Durham, I would say sincerely, bitch and mo, bro. And of course... Patrick Stewart, Michael Chiklis, Telly Savalas, Dwayne Johnson, Ross Kemp, Phil Collins, Ed Harris, Stanley Tucci, and uh, 
Vin Diesel, among others, totally approve of that finely polished cranium, so beautifully maintained and optimised for both low aerodynamic drag and peak convective heat transfer. <laughs> right about now on the shore of Lake St. Clair. Imagine that, rocking the dome. Hashtag respect. So, where were we? The basic problem here, according to Cap D, is that the Wrangler doesn't actually have a floor in the rear passenger compartment. I'm not kidding, dude. It's oddly Fred Flintstone like that. What flooring there is, is actually the battery case itself. Like, the metal box that holds the cells is the floor. I couldn't make that up. Neither could he. He's too respectful of the facts. So, I propose a thought experiment. If a fictional dudette named, perhaps, Aisha Jones straps her three young offspring, gorgeous young future hood rats, into her Wrangler 4 by e deep down in Big Beaver, at the crack of dawn in the shadow of Redbush Mountain, and heads to the 7-Eleven at Fishcorn, and that is actually a place, Fishcorn, FYI, to procure the usual family staples, I don't know, Pepsi, peanut butter, jelly, Pop-Tarts, Cheerios, ammo, ski mask. The next generation will slide out of Big Beaver, poised precariously on top of the battery itself, which hardly seems very safe or an especially responsible design decision, at least to me. If you look at this Jeep Hybrid, it appears that the battery box is actually inside the passenger compartment of the vehicle. That is a terrible idea in my mind. These batteries should be on the exterior of the vehicle. On top of that, there's an access panel underneath the rear seat of the vehicle. And you can see in these after photos that it actually melted through. That is the cranially streamlined Captain Durham himself there. And you should show him some subscriber love in my estimation, because right there he is being brave enough to respect the facts and say what he really thinks. And he is sufficiently well trained to understand what those facts actually mean. God bless the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. You don't actually see such informed straight talk every day in the land of online opinion and malleable facts, let's not forget. Cap D has an excellent video on this. It's called Electric Car Explosions Worldwide. Watch it, dude. You know you want to, right? I'll put a link up there and make it easy. I'll even wait while you watch. This collision of honesty and technical competency is getting rarer and rarer, frankly. Cap D is thus certainly swimming against the tsunami of electric evangelism that prevails, is he not? I'll put a link to his channel in the description and you should subscribe now, dude. It's called Stashed Training. It's Cap S T A C H E Cap D, all one word, training. So check it out, Stashed Training. With the Zoe EV, it's a similar worrying irresponsible design story. The Renault Zoe, if you've seen my other videos, you know they also have a firefighter's access in the inside of the vehicle underneath the rear seat. The fact that these batteries have direct access to off-gas into the passenger compartment of the vehicle is extremely dangerous and a bad idea. Here's why this is a preposterously terrible design idea. You might be trapped in the vehicle, hypothetically, perhaps in the aftermath of a crash. You could have just been T-boned. You'll be dazed and confused, and the car could be jammed between two vehicles, one on this side and one on that side, and thus no escape for you or your incipient hood rats in the next generation. The passenger compartment might then start filling, problematically, with gas from the battery, which is entering thermal runaway. And it's filling up because there's no fucking floor. Oops a daisy. I'd suggest this is not a good time to be worrying about the imminent explosion, dude. Because, <clears throat> well, the gas is going to kill you well before the explosion. So there's that. According to this paper from nine credible academic researchers in China, 
where the vast majority of the world's lithium-ion batteries are made. During thermal runaway, lithium-ion batteries produce a large amount of gas, which can cause unimaginable disasters in electric vehicles and electrochemical energy storage systems when the batteries fail and subsequently combust or explode. Unimaginable disasters, unquote. Like, don't hold back, dudes. Give it to us straight, we can take it. I must say, this particular statement, which is the very first sentence in the friggin' report, is grossly at odds with all of this totally safe dude rhetoric that we hear from society's electric evangelists, is it not? The champions of electrification are quite big on telling us that this kind of thing rarely happens, if ever. But they are very light on, in my view, when it comes to acknowledging the staggering danger when such a thing does occur. The report actually gets even better. The primary gas components during thermal runaway for nickel, cobalt, manganese and lithium iron phosphate batteries include hydrogen gas, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ethene and methane. In other words, you're going to be trapped in a toxic environment that's also a suffocation hazard and therefore incapable of sustaining life. Plus, it's explosive. Yay! In the Wrangler explosion in Europe, the fire department actually got the call at 12.05 to the effect that the vehicle was smoking. The explosion occurred at 12.20, despite four minutes of considerable irrigation by firefighters who had two windows breached and two hoses running directly inside the passenger compartment at the time of the blast. So. Let's just change a couple of little variables here, shall we? Let's make it a crash instead of just a standalone thermal runaway. And let's put fictional Aisha and the three fledgling hood rats inside the car. If they can all hold their breath for 15 minutes, then they really, really should start worrying about the upcoming explosion. But if not, I'd say they have far more immediate concerns, wouldn't you? Blowing up is literally, in this case, the least of their problems, I'd suggest. In my view, this rhetoric about just how safe lithium-ion batteries in EVs are from the nutbag evangelists, it fails to account for the severity, like the consequences, of the runaways which will inevitably occur as we roll out more and more of these vehicles it's going to be absolutely no consolation, like no consolation whatsoever for your family to learn that you died in a low probability event. No one hears that and go, oh, oh, well, that's okay then. <sighs> for example, right, a scented candle might be, I don't know, 10,000 times more likely to burn your house down, statistically, compared with a white phosphorus grenade. I suggest that it is a gross abuse of the rules of logic to conclude, therefore, that it is safe to have such a grenade just lying around on the frickin' coffee table, but perhaps we should all ban candles by 2035. This is that. Right? EVs are really safe, except for the statistically occasional hazmat explosion catastrophes. Except for that, really safe. Combustion cars do burn more often than EVs. Like, obviously, we need to look deeper into the statistics and control for arson and make those statistics a little bit more rational. But you can often suppress an internal combustion fire with a freaking garden hose, thus saving the next generation of hood rats, let's not forget, until the professionals arrive and take over. I wouldn't be trying that with an EV that was off-gassing, frankly. The final point I'd like to make here is safety regulations. Median society, non-engineers, expect there to be a raft of safety regulations that just jump in and protect them especially here in advanced Western democracies, even pretend ones like Australia. Often, 
such regulations just don't exist, dude. There's no regulation that stops your kettle from blowing up in your face while you're making your coffee tomorrow morning. In the manner of some, I don't know, ersatz claim or mine. There's no regulation for that. Nor is there a regulation that prevents your freaking TV from burning the house down as you sleep dreaming about, I don't know, boobies. There's also no regulation telling senior Stellantis shitheads or Alliance assholes that it's not okay to fail to protect the occupants of their vehicles from the toxic gas produced by thermal runaway. And the fix here is so simple, dude. You just separate the battery systematically from the passenger compartment. You don't make the battery enclosure part of the passenger compartment. You know, you do it with an actual floor that's not the battery box and some level of thermal insulation between the two, thus buying some important time for trapped Aisha and the three hood rats. In my view, as someone who also bled from the ears in the manner of Cap D with a dome that's almost as efficient thermally and aerodynamically, but who could never rock a mo, quite that bitchin'. This is what happens when car makers decide it's okay to play fast and loose with the lives of their customers and the regulators are asleep at the frickin' wheel. Subscribe to Stashed Training. Do, do Cap D here a solid because he certainly deserves your support in my estimation for his fine work blocking the flow of ambient bullshit on this one. I never thought I would see the Ford Pinto rise from the ashes like some kind of fucked up phoenix, albeit with a giant battery jammed up its clacker. And yet... Here we are.